All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. This is House Ways and Means. And um, today we are, um, in, addition, in addition to welcoming Emily to the committee, uh, our first task, hello, Emily. Um, we are going to start with Steve Klein, who's going to give us a review. And it's a pretty exhaustive review because it's a pretty huge bill um, of the uh, federal legislation that just passed and is sending a great deal of money our way. So um, unless somebody wants to jump in with something before we start, um, I'm going to go ahead and let Steve begin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Steve Klein from Joint Fiscal. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through essentially two documents, both of which are on our website. We have a Joint Fiscal Office has created a COVID-19 uh, page, and you can get them there, but they're also uh, on your website and available now. And the two documents, first I'm going to use is an NCSL summary of the bill, and I'm just going to highlight that document and different aspects of it. And then I'm gonna talk about a spreadsheet that, that Senator Leahy has put together about um, some of the specific appropriations that are in the bill. Uh, one of the things I'm gonna do is I'll go relatively fast and then um, what needs to happen is if I get incoherent or I go too fast, um, raise your hand or let um, the chair and, or a source know and they'll stop me or if there's questions as you go along, <laughs> it's a good idea to just have the um, uh, same thing, stop me and, and ask. So, uh, so I just want to, I'll start right off. The what well, real focus that this is, this is, we just had this week, uh, the Senate, and today, hopefully the House will pass the third uh, coronavirus relief bill. And there probably will be one more. It's, uh, at least that's my thinking, and we'll talk about that later. The first one was a small bill that provided money for, um, primarily for the health response, so really, um, the second bill was medium bill, which uh, provided our Medicaid, um, a higher Medicaid match rate, some money for uninsured. Uh, and um, I, that bill passed last week. It was like the week before last week. And then this week's bill is the $2 trillion um, bill, which has a lot of money in a lot of different places. And uh, it's gonna take a while to figure it out. Um, the third bill, uh, the fourth bill rather, uh, may correct some things in this bill, but also may move in a whole new direction. We can talk about that later. Um, I'm going to take a minute here because I've got sun that I didn't realize what's going to come through there. Uh, uh, Steve, while you're moving okay. the sun around, um, just to tell people that uh, Sorsha briefly got dropped. She's coming back on. And somebody needs to tell me how I can keep this participant list on the side while the view is showing. Can someone tell me what to push? Emily, uh, I, I don't know how to unmute you. Can you unmute? Yeah. Um, so when it's up, if you minimize your um, the video to change it to speaker, okay, like highlight speaker view, it's hard to remember the exact speaker name view. of it when we're yeah. not in there. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then you can pull the participant list back up and you can back sort of stack okay. them one on top That's of That's all another. I need. It keeps dropping out because I don't know how to do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Emily, um, so yeah, uh, I sort of was going to have the document on the screen, but. Uh, yeah. Does it, people have their iPads because it's, it's it, on it's, your iPad. Um, yeah. I think a lot uh, of us do. So let me start off. And I mean, there's uh, the first piece of this thing summarizes a lot of the aspects of the bill and we're going to go through a number of them, but uh, just the overview, 150 billion coronavirus relief fund, we're gonna start with that. The education fund, um, which is higher education and K through 12, that'll be probably we're gonna end with that. And then let Mark go into details about that. Uh, the um, disaster relief money, um, we'll talk briefly on that. And what I'm gonna do is sort of go through the key elements and you will have time at your own leisure to go through details. Uh, Okay. So uh, this is a, it's a good list. This, this document is sort of great because it allows you to click on the area of interest and you'll see a lot of the programs. Well, the big one, the, the big thing I wanted to focus on is the, the uh, direct economic stimulus, the funding to states. And it's 150 billion. What's really unique about this bill is it has the highest um, small state minimum we've ever seen in a bill. Uh, if you take 150 million, Vermont's population is generally about 
percent of the U.S. population, just below 0.2 percent. So we generally assume we're going to get a small state minimum of 0.2 percent. The statute and the way this bill is written, and this 150 billion, we get 1.25 billion, which is comes to about 0.8 percent, about four times what our normal small state minimum would be. You know, there's a lot of uh, I, you know, obviously no one's really written about why that happened. I think it's, a, you know, we have obviously a, a very important um, senator that's involved with the committee. Uh, you know, I, I think also that spreads the money to a lot of small states and uh, the, uh, a lot, it was a Senate bill and for the Senate, uh, a lot of states that um, probably have control, have power in this, a lot of the senators in the, in the Senate are probably from the smaller um or medium-sized states, and they it may be things like that. We don't know, but it's a huge number. And it, the states that are complaining about this uh, program are New York's, the Californias, the states. Because if you take 100% of it and put 60, I uh, take 40% of those dollars and put in small state minimums, essentially, you really are um, not going to have as much money for the large states. So that's just one of the things about this. Uh, Money. So we get 1.25 billion, which is a, a, a really large amount of money. But there's a couple of um, key issues with that. There, and the just go if you go down a little bit to the um, where it says funds can be used for costs that, and you'll see, are necessary expenditures incurred to COVID-19 um, were not okay. accounted for. Yeah. Um, I just want to let the committee know that Sersha um, is not able to get back on the call um, oh, no. in the meeting. Um, IT is going to join, um, but that means that uh, I hope people have the document up somewhere that they can see it. We don't have somebody to control the uh, posting of it and moving it around at the moment. So, um, so if you if you have a way to access it on a phone or on a iPad or somewhere, please do. Or yeah, or and, and 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 this is a really just ask any questions. Stop me if this mm -hmm. is. And I'll try to go more in detail of what I'm saying so that that's not a problem. If you close your eyes, maybe you can imagine the document. Um, okay. But anyway, so imagine there's this clause that talks about what the money can be used for, and there are only three. There are three conditions: are necessary expenditures incurred due to COVID-19 were not accounted for in the most recent budget and were incurred between March 1, 2020 and ends December 30th, 2020. So there are some glaring issues with that language. Since in Vermont, one of our biggest problems is a decline in, and Graham will talk about this later, the decline in revenues, um, which is going to make it hard to fund our base, uh, base budget. This one on the face of it is for expenditures, for needed expenditures and not for revenue replacement. So we've talked to the congressional delegation about it. That's one of the issues nationally people hope can get addressed in a corrections bill. But right now the approach is this has to be, everything has to be tied to expenditures in this period and, and not for revenue replacement, which creates a real problem. It also means we have lots of money for uh, creative um, uh, expenditures incurred due to COVID-19, but as the base money goes down, uh, and there's other language about I mean, of effort, we have may have a problem, and we'll talk about other problems. With that the second thing is it says, so Steve. Um, yeah. Steve, I'm going to uh, just interrupt and make sure that I'm hearing this correctly. Um, the this money can't be used to replace revenue, um, right. and so. Um, uh, attempts to address the situation through revenue reductions is problematic. Correct. That's our reading right now. That, okay. um, but it, we'll talk more about that and what it what it means yep. uh, down the road. We we think this is primarily an expenditure vehicle, yep. um, and okay. so the um, the other question it says uh, we're not accounted for in the budget most recently approved as the date of enactment. Well. That budget is the budget adjustment that we passed um, uh, about a month ago in uh, or late February. The issue is that there's been some talk nationally about does that, you know, what other, what constitutes a budget? And so, for example, earlier this week, we passed House 742, which is a 
it's not a budget, but it does have some spending implications in that bill. So one of the things you'll see happening is the Vermont governor is not going to sign that bill until the uh, president signs this bill, because uh, the, we just want to make sure of the date of enactment of even 742. I think this is a non-issue, but just to give you, just to be careful, I think that you're going to see the governor hold on to the 742 bill and sign it after the, en the enactment of this bill. Okay, uh, so on, on the one hand, what you're seeing now and what we're all thinking about is how do we use this money uh, in a way that, um, uh, how do we use this money creatively uh, because within those conditions? And there's really, I would say four concepts about using the money the and we're gonna talk about it um, in uh, many ways. Let me just take a second here to pull up one other document in my own life. Here. And Steve, uh, well, I'll just, yeah. Since we're kind of, uh, ad, uh, you know, dealing with the documents in different ways, could you remind us which document you're on occasionally? Well, I'm still on the NCSL okay. uh, sheet uh, where okay. it just provides 150 billion. And, and I should just say, the, the, when I think about this bill, I have it in categories. One is this sort of large amount of state relief and which we're going to talk more about for a while. Then the second thing is um, categorical spending. And we're going to go through a spreadsheet which outlines some of the categorical money that goes to different entities. And the third is direct funding. And direct funding is primarily to like K through 12 education, hospitals, um, higher ed. And, and, that, and so that'll be the third area we, we talk about. And then there's other pieces of the bill. And I probably should, the biggest, some of the biggest things is money to individuals and things like that. Like, uh, checks and uh, unemployment comp and, and stuff like that. So uh, just one other thing on the 150 before we get into the detail of that, or I should say the 1.25 billion that Vermont gets. One of the conditions of that is if you are in a state which has a city of, which has a population of over 500,000 people, you can apply directly. You don't have to go through the state. <clears throat> Vermont is not in that case. So any relief to local governments is really comes from this source. And so we need to, I mean, they'll be up, they can get relief for other lines, but this is a, a source. We need to at least ask or consider how much of the 1.25 billion is made available to local governments. And one of the questions is, traditionally that would be cities and towns. The question is, and I've asked Ledge Council about this, and we just have to think about it is, could schools be considered a, you know, a local government or not? or is that something else we can use the money for? So one of the questions that's gonna come up is um, uh, how, um, how does that get done? What do, we, what do we do for local governments? How is, how is that addressed? And it's a, you know, one of the mystery in, in, in this is how much of this bill, it, how's the legislature gonna play a role? How's the executive gonna play a role? How are those decisions gonna be made? But I would say one piece is that sort of, and uh, you know, local governments, what the language will be. Uh, again, it has to say in the same stricture of local government money has to be to uh, provide for expenses incurred as a result of COVID-19, you know, based beyond the base budget and the, uh, all the towns past budgets that are as a town meeting week, except for nine. Uh, and so that there's these interesting questions and the same things will be applied to anything we do for towns. And there is recapture language that the, uh, the federal government may recapture the money if we use it incorrectly. So uh, we're going to have to, we just have to think about it. And like in any major issue like this, um, there's a lot of gray areas. And you know, part of the legislature and the executive role will be to figure out how far into that gray area do we want to go how creative can we get in the way of using the money? So let me take a stop there and see if we're entertaining any questions or I keep going, depending on what you uh, want to Let do. me see, anybody want to jump in and ask a question? No? Okay, well, great. George, George has a question. Oh, George does? Okay, he does, go ahead. Do you think as far as the schools go, the fact that our, um, our schools are, you know, by our statutes, municipalities, um, will that help us in being able to just- Yeah, you know, I actually think, we're, and again, I'm, I, it's over my pay grade in a sense, but I think that they are local. I think we could count them as local governments. And mm -hmm. I think that they will, we will be able to provide more money. But the problem with it is 
that um, we just know it's only to reimburse expenses related to. And uh, yeah, I think it'll work out. I just don't know enough about it to, I just haven't, that's a research that needs to be done. So conceivably all the food that they're um, yes, sending absolutely. out is something Although, that- we'll, right, we'll see later that there's money especially de dedicated for nutrition programs too. So one of the questions that comes up and when you'll see this, when you look at the um, specific appropriations, if somebody is getting money for a specific appropriation, is it, and yet this money is also tied to specifically address needs created by COVID-19, do we have to subtract what's already gone out in the other bills? That's, those are pieces that we need to figure out. Uh, but yes, I think that's a no brainer. I guess, I think you're right. I think the, the creative questions is, how, you know, in, in law, there's this concept about, um, uh, that you take your victim as you find them in some ways. So, you know, there's a lot of underlying issues in schools. And um, if you would argue that COVID-19 took an uh, issue and made it a little bit worse, uh, how creative can we be in using the money um, either for the state or for the schools or others to provide for those underlying needs? And that's when we, so, so I'm just gonna go, let me go through one more thing. So first we're gonna cover the direct costs. Um, and that's what um, we'll do. Then there's going to be sort of these, then there's levels of moving from that. And one of the questions is really, um, 1.25 billion is a lot of money. I mean, think about it in terms of our, and given that the bill has other pieces that bring it closer to $2 billion, and we'll talk, we'll talk about those. The question really is, um, uh, well, we're going to have to get creative to use it. I mean, it, and so I think that there's room for doing lots of uh, um, creative stuff. So, uh, okay. I mean, I, you know, just to give you some of the questions in my, that are bothering on my mind is, uh, and, you know, and, and that's why I think part of what's going to have to happen next week, I'm, I'm getting lost in my own thoughts here, and I'm sorry to be confusing, um, is, you know, what are those parameters? How do we use it? Do we say, first, let's meet the immediate needs. Second, do we, uh, uh, oh, and the other question is how much do we use for today for uh, uh, April, May, June? And how much do we really reserve for um, the next fiscal year where we, we don't know if this is a two month crisis or if this is a multi-month crisis? And how do we divide time-wise this resource? Um, how much can we set aside for, uh, indirect coronavirus impacts. And, you know, we all heard them, the business issue, the um, hospitals, uh, do we, um, do we uh, eliminate co-pays and deductibles for all Vermonters? You know, do we uh, uh, put a lot of money into hospitals for, uh, to keep the system going and, and all that, you know, um, or, you know, the pension funds, which have lost phenomenal amounts of money because of the downturn in the market related to COVID-19 in March, uh, or schools. Um, you know, just to go really far afield, school construction. You know, we have a lot of un so unsanitary conditions in schools. Could we argue that uh, that's a problem when you move people back to a school and we need to use some of this money to, to create a better work teaching and working environment for people or uh, new systems for communication, you know, because of the way the schools are done. So there's a lot of room for creativity. And, and uh, you know, I think we need to make sure we have the bucket of timeline solved, like how much for now, how much for later. We need to make sure we have the immediate expenses covered. We need to cover the needs of people. Uh, we have to think about the needs of people, businesses, and the um, res responders, the people, the emergency employees. And then we also need to be creative if we have money left for how do we use this to, in the long-term benefit Vermont. Uh, so, and, and Steve, yeah. one of the other questions is who makes those decisions? Yes, and that's a huge one. Um, and uh, you know what you and I, again, I feel like you you guys, I feel like you, nobody can kick me because I'm over here at my house now. But but I have to be careful not to go beyond my role. But you know that's a question. One of the things you don't want to do is have a battle, a public dispute between the executive and legislative branch. And so the ideal thing would be to have some sort of strong cooperation on the part of the leadership to figure that out or to set really clear guidelines. It's, it's sort of beyond any one committee. It's not like the appropriations committee should start appropriating. There really needs to be a frame and, a, and, a, and a, uh, some type of policy direction of how do we approach this money. And I think that there was 
when the era, when the era money was here a number of years ago, and we did get a fairly sizable chunk. At that time, there was the governor and legislative leader set up a little working group um, from the three branches, you know, to to think this through. Uh, you know, it's 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 a really this is a key question, and it's something that's way beyond sort of a. Uh, our role, I'm doing is saying, it, and as you just said, it, it, there's a political con calculation needs to be made. There's policy decisions need to be made. And the amount of money is such that it that you really want to do it right. And you want to think it through. Yeah. Uh, Joey oh, has a question. Joey? I think Steve just answered it because I was asking, how did we handle the era money? And yeah, um, and I, and I, you know, I understood the you said it, it was a group, small group. There, well, there was a group that met, and I think it was, I, I'm trying to remember who was on it. Um, maybe, I don't know who was Janet. Uh, it was, yeah. It was you and uh, uh, Senator Kitchell, and yeah. um, I think it was the Secretary of Administration at the time uh, from Burlington, who was that computer person, or it was somebody, I don't remember who it was from the administration, but yeah, I think you were part of it. Mm -hmm. And so, well, and it, But and there were different was, levels of decision making. So, right, and it wasn't really, they didn't decide everything, but they were clearly a, a policy group that advised people and helped keep us working together. Yeah. And, you know, to me, I think that there's something to be said for that type of uh, structure. Uh, I, I remember that committees also met and, and made lists for their specific area that they um, watch yeah. over. Yeah. Okay, so that's... that's um, I'm, I don't feel like I'm shouting. I probably, I hope I'm not too loud for the committee. Okay. So I'm going to move off this top. Oh, the other thing is in Washington right now, if you look at the national on our website, you'll see publications by FFIS who. Uh, uh, George, George has got a I'm question. Sorry. Yep. So I actually, it's a comment. Um, the consensus that I'm seeing in the medical world is that this is going to extend into the summer and go away sort of in the summer, but come back with a vengeance in the fall. Right. So as we start thinking about how we're going to divvy up the money time-wise, yeah, I think we need to be really careful to know that that we were covered when bad things happen come fall. Absolutely. And that, that's why I think just as much as the decision-making has to divide it between the various categories of need, you know, immediate, the uh, indirect sort of things, and then this long-term thing, as you said, we, we need to be a cognizant that we probably shouldn't let, you know, spend, keep, what are they, that expression about, keep some of your powder dry or whatever it is, just be ready for this to be a longer event than we, than um, people are thinking about. And, it, you know, if you think about, you, you know, there's obviously a desire on the part of all people to fix it now and to put it out and, you know, solve every need now. But to the extent that there's big needs in the summer and your, you know, the election is November, you're going to have that same feeling again all through the, the summer. So I just I think that there's what you said is, is critical. You know, not to not to create a uh, an allocation of all the money right now, and, and to be careful about a uh, uh, you know sort of a, uh, sometimes when we have a lot of money, we sort of want to we create feeding friends or something like that. It's a real important to think about husbanding yeah. the resource. Uh, anyway, Sam, I'm going beyond my actual world. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> We're glad. <laughs> Sam, uh, go ahead. Hey, Steve, I, I'm just curious. I've never really been through this before. How does it work in terms of like reimbursement from the feds? Or I mean, they don't they don't send a check and the state doesn't put it in their bank account. Um, how does well, the money actually, flow? Actually, you're in this case, you're not right. Um, we are. Oh. The law requires that within 30 days of enactment of this bill they're gonna send us a check for $1.25 billion. And I've been talking to the treasurer about this. It's a, it's a slight problem because we have a um, requirement that um, banks that hold our money have to collateralize that money. And there's no bank in Vermont that has capacity to uh, collateralize that much money. So she's talking with banks in Vermont to see how do we, you know, can we split it up? You know, she may have to use out of state banks. It's, it's a really, you know, the federal government has this unique thing. They can, they just in the bill said the treasury shall issue a check and within 30 days of an act and send it to Vermont. So uh, we are going to get the money and it'll be sitting in our account. Okay. And then we draw against so, it. Is that what yeah. happens? What? And then we draw against it and have we to draw against it that. And, and the federal yep. government can come back and say, boy, you really blew that. We'll want it back. Got but it. We got it. And it's uh Okay. It may uh, change the nature of our uh, 
cash flow issue for the spring, but um, we still are going to probably pass language about uh, uh, to deal with um, allowing for uh, interfund transfers to get make sure we have enough to cover shortfalls in different funds, and that's that's sort of a more inside yeah. baseball type um, issue. If I could ask people to use the computer raise hand thing, that would be really helpful. Um, but Robin, I see you. Go ahead. Okay, I had to find the raise hand again. Um, just a quick question on that, and I'm sure the interest rates aren't very high, but do we get to keep the interest regardless? <laughs> you know, we we haven't really. I thought about that. I really we have we haven't really talked about that, and so I don't. I have seen no language about that. I imagine so, but as you pointed out, uh, the interest rates really aren't that high. But still, right. you're right. When you have that big a sum of money. Yeah. It's, some, it's something that probably in about three or four weeks we'll get a chance to think about, but it, I think at this point, my assumption is yes, that, it's, okay. that we, we get to keep the interest. Great. I, I wouldn't put it in the stock market. No, no, I think that's a good okay. point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, let me ahead. see if there's anybody else. Nope. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I just want to, so on the same sheet, the NCSL, if you would slide down, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It has the capacity to click on everything. Like you can click on direct payments and expanded unemployment benefits. And every category has the types of elements in the bill that are uh, in there. And so it's a great description of what the bill does on the uh, overall. And so it's, uh, you can click on human services and read about the programs. So it, this is a, a really useful tool. Um, but what I'm gonna do now is switch to the second document, which is called uh, formula funding for Vermont. I hope it's called that on your website. Uh, yes. Oh my God. There it is right on your screen. Um, and this is a document put together by uh, Senator Leahy's office. And uh, it's a, um, uh, it, what's good about it is it lists some of the Vermont impacts and you get a chance to see uh, how much money we get, and, and just to go to the top of it and how broad this bill is, I mean, grants the state arts and humanities programs um, by grants for organizations. Uh, uh, there seems to be two of these, and I'm not sure a lot about why they're different, but um, if you, um, uh, these ones are just, uh, if you look at the uh, amounts of money, 421,000, 400,000, those are closer to what I would say is our population share. You know, that if you think about 0.1.8%, a little less than 2%. 2% on the first one would be $500,000, give or take. Uh, next one would be 600,000. So we're sort of below that. Um, then, then you talk about this um, grants for uh, uh, public health preparedness, you can see that. Uh, funding for the election, really, the preseason, the voting, and you can see three million dollars. So, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is what? How does this? Um, uh, you know, how does it interact with the other one? So, the other one, the money is definitely for costs that are incurred because of the COVID nineteen, and here we have direct money to help us with the um, COVID nineteen. Can we double count? Can we apply this money and then use that for um, the same costs? Or do we have to take this off the top, meet the, use these to make the needs and have it be net? I think double counting seems a little bit problematical, but I don't know. I mean, these are the things we are gonna have to figure out. Uh, you can see, yeah. Steve, Jim Maslin has a question. Okay. Jim, go ahead. Jim, you're muted still. All right, Steve, start over. I'll start over. Um, on the on the document you were just re reviewing, I didn't see UVM or the Vermont State Colleges listed. Right, that's a separate category. So okay. Thank I want to. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert sort of that what I would call the categorical appropriations, and then I have this other category in my brain of category of money that goes directly to other organizations. Thank you. So that would be in that category. Thank you. So, um, so I, I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time going through this, but I want to just, it's there and it's, uh, um, it's pretty broad. I mean, they have things in here 
that were jumped out of me like LIHEAP money, $4.1 million. And so the we have already pretty much funded our LIHEAP for this year. We are uh, uh, through that season. I think a lot of states, it's hot and cool. And so this might be summer money for them. Uh, our budget is pretty much done. So does that that may mean we can carry forward existing LIE money if there is some left to next year. So there may be room there to uh, create capacity for the future. Uh, there's a, a small amount of money I saw somewhere for um, weatherization. You know, uh, uh, so it, it did, uh, public transit got some money and, and there, you can see uh, the emergency relief. We, un we understand that's 100% funding. There's no match on some of that. Uh, one of the things that's going to happen is um, the the transportation agency may spend this money to get other projects going forth and then use sort of current money. There's a lot of moving money around. Everybody's trying to figure out how to maximize it, how to best meet our project plans. And just to give you a sense of the changing world, if you were to ask us two days ago, um, the administration, and you probably have heard of this on the news, the administration had this plan to put out tons of, um, well, as much as we could in projects, because it, you know, they thought it would be helpful given the um, economic stress, the employment, and getting a lot of work done. And as some states have already started working on projects that are south of here, have indicated the roads are sort of empty and get a lot more done quicker. But the most recent word we heard is the governor has basically said, we're not gonna do any projects right now because of the stay in place order. So, uh, it's an interesting dilemma because uh, some of this will just be able to be done. Some of it's for airports. Um, we need to, uh, uh, you know, how Vermont's much construction season is so short. How does all this work out? And I think they're going to, the apartments are going to have to figure out how that, how that works out. You'll, you'll see money in here for um, childcare uh, assistance, and you'll see money in here for, uh, I think for food, the child care thing, 4.3 million, you know, do we use that for the, um, uh, I mean, there's so many child care needs that it could be used, but that is one source of possible money for what's going on with schools. Uh, so again, we have this question about which pot do we take it out of, the categorical pot or the uh, 1.25 billion pot? And it actually raises another interesting question that up till uh, we got this money, um, if you were to talk to AHS, they have been, there was about 38 million the first bill, gave, the second bill gave us in um, Medicaid increased match. And eight, then it'll be about 19 million per quarter after that, as long as this uh, national emergency is in place. And the, they were gonna use all of that in human services, but Medicare increased match is really totally free general fund dollars. So, because basically it's extra, it means we have to use less state dollars to cover um, the Medicaid and the federal government's paying a bigger share. So it frees up our state dollars. So all of a sudden it, it makes very little sense to use that money, which is free general fund dollars to cover uh, the healthcare needs. It makes sense to use this money, which is tied specifically to the needs that are generated by um, the COVID-19 problem. And that pre up money might be better used for things dealing with the revenue downturn or dealing with the base budget that, where they, they can be used. So this is really, uh, and, and we met with, I mean, the testimony of ASS yesterday, this didn't even come up. I, I, you're, you're hearing a lot of this and if you'll, you'll hear, if you're Adam Gresham, you'll hear him talk about it in different ways. This is real time. I mean, you know, we've had these discussions the last day or so. The bill has yet to pass. Um, so this is what we're laying out are a bunch of the things to think about what's going to happen. And um, I want to just couch that there's a ton of um, uncertainty, change, adjustment that needs to occur. Maybe I'll take a breath and let if there's any questions or. Right. I, um, I've got a look to see if others do, but I have a question about um, this, a couple things. One is timing. Is there how much time do we have to make some of these decisions? Okay, so that's a, a good question. It really varies. Um, uh, I think the there are some decisions which have which we have no time, and uh, I'll give you an example of that. Um, the Brattleboro retreat, Brattleboro, ah, Brattleboro retreat 
um, is one of the institutions that has very major financial issues. And um, last week, I think it was, um, the administration sent out $750,000 to help them get through their fiscal needs. There may be other institutions like that. And money is going out the door today. So, um, uh, hold on, look at that. Uh, uh, so there's the same type of um, issue. Uh, and so the, and there, there's a lot of the food programs are going to get federal money, but before they get the federal money, there may be a period of time when they need assistance from the state. So in some cases, we need to just act right away and the administration is acting right away. In some cases, uh, and pres preservation of the human service system is a really major important issue. Uh, but then again, you know, as, as we get through, so the timing is all over the map. It's everything from immediate to long-term thinking. Uh, the other question I have, um, and I know you've been thinking about this, but as we use reserves, is there a way to move this money into reserves so that we can rebuild them? Uh, can you repeat that? I'm, Sorry. Um, I'm, uh, as we use reserves, uh, both yeah. in the education fund and the general fund, I suppose transportation as well, is it possible that you to move this money into the reserves and refill them? I do not think we can. Um, I mean, that's that's part of the revenue question. You know, uh, is that a an expenditure? This is for expenditures, yeah. and I'm not sure um, that qualifies. Uh, but I, you know, again, these are they're all fair questions. Um, uh, I, my first thought is no, but you know that I would also say that this is an issue that um, this whole question about limiting it from uh, use for meeting revenue downgrade issues um, may be one of those issues that's fixed in the next bill if there is an, a next bill, because mm -hmm. we've you know and you're going to be hearing from somebody from Leahy's office you might want to ask me about that mm -hmm. uh, all throughout um, the NCSL FFIS that seems to be one of the quote technical corrections that they're everybody's pushing for. Because uh, it affects so many states. Yeah. And if uh, that happens, see. all the things you've laid about could be, could be done. Yeah. Uh, let me see if anyone else has has a hand up. I don't see anybody. Um, so, uh, did you have more? You were gonna. No, I'm willing to stop. The, oh no, I have to. I want to just respond about the this third category. Um, actually, there's two more categories. One which I'm not going to spend time on, which is the checks individuals and. You can have the uh, uh, lay people talk about that and the UI, but the, the other category is direct appropriations to the ho um, to the hospitals, to the K through 12 and higher ed. And those are part of the bill. Uh, Mark will be able to talk about the K through 12 money uh, and the uh, higher ed. Neither of those, those two share one appropriation. It's, uh, and it, uh, the way I understand the division, both the, uh, schools and the higher ed institutions feel that they have not enough money to meet their needs. So uh, Mark can talk a little bit about that, it, but it goes direct to them. Hospital, same thing. They're going to get uh, nationwide, the number was quoted to me, about 20 million per hospital. And I don't know what that means for Vermont. Uh, uh, again, that may be um, uh, some sort of way below what's needed. And it's a uh, um, I, you know, I understand and the hospitals need to talk about that, but the hospital crisis and the healthcare institutional crisis is huge. And, and just one thing on a flag about that, by having people not do elective procedures, you all may know this, and I, I don't want to bore you, uh, but by not doing elective procedures, you're really taking a, a tremendous amount out of the cash flow budget, so for hospitals. And so uh, it, it may, in the short term, limit uh, our Medicaid exposure, but it, this is part of, it was an important thing to do to make room for the uh, COVID-19 cases, but it is that that behavior is, is going to create issues for their budgets. So when I, I would stop there if you, unless there's questions. Well, there's one. also this authority that we gave the administration to um, uh, reduce or waive the provider tax, um, which, um, is just authority, so they yeah. don't have to use it. But it seems, like, given all this, that we wouldn't want them to. Um, right. Um, although, although yeah. I don't so, know. And actually, yeah. you're really right. One of the things that would, and this is just again, 
I hadn't really thought about that, but that would probably not be the thing to do is reduce the private tax. What would be the thing to do is use this money to address the hospital exactly. needs. Exactly. And, and I think in many respects, that same concept goes elsewhere. Do we really cut taxes where produces free money for us to figure out what to do with and right. instead use a somewhat um, uh, restrained money to really meet the needs? And that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, other questions anyone has? Um, no? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, that all you've got, Steve? All you've got? Oh, that's all I'm going to show you. $2 billion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. A lot of money, but a lot of caution. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We've got a lot of work. Yeah, you have right. got a lot of work in front yeah. of you. We've got some, but yeah. got a we lot. Do too. It's, and so. the, the key thing is management, which you guys have to do. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. And I guess, uh, Sorsha, we'll go to Mark. Is that what you were suggesting? I think yes. uh, we've got Jeff Fannin on our list. I, I keep losing my agenda. I'm sorry here. Jeff um, can't come on until 11, so we could go to Mark now. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. That sounds fine. Is Mark here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I can see you. Okay. Okay, so um, do you want me to talk a little bit about... Um, the uh, federal stimulus bill to start with. Um, yes. I'm not sure what you wanted me to go over, but I can start with that one. Okay, so um, the, the the federal stimulus bill uh, includes about thirteen and a half um, billion dollars for formula grants to, to states for K through twelve education. That's the total, and um, ninety percent of that money would go directly to school districts, and the state can retain ten percent of it for emergency needs. Um, the a back of the envelope um, estimate of Vermont share that have done um, indicates that uh, the share that we would get would be about $30 million. So that would go a long way towards um, closing the education fund gap in 2020. Yeah. However, that money is going to go to the agency of education and then directly out to school districts. So it's going to entirely bypass the education fund. So the hole that we're looking at in the education fund in 2020 wouldn't be addressed by this. Now I looked back because I remembered that's what we did. Yeah. When we did this back um, in the Great Recession, and we got two years, we got 18 and a half million dollars two years in a row. Mm -hmm. And what we did at that time was we reduced the general fund transfer to the education fund by that exact amount, and the money the money then went directly from the feds or from the agency of education to the districts, the districts were made whole in terms of what they were expecting. And it addressed the problem in the education fund. Now, however, we no longer have a general fund transfer. So right. we need to think about how that, how that might work. Right. There's also um, a maintenance of effort provision in there, but I don't think that's a problem because it looks at um, state spending over the prior three years and averages it. So we, we've had growing, growing expenditures every year. So that, that may be, not be a problem, but I haven't done the analysis yet to figure that out. So that's just something else to keep in mind. So I do remember this from last time and it was, it was awful, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I, I just went back, we, we looked, I think it was in 2010 and 2011, mm -hmm. we deducted $18.4 million each year from the general mm -hmm. fund transfer. Mm -hmm. and the districts then receive that money. Mm -hmm. The other wrinkle here is that we don't have any discretion as to how this money goes out to districts. Um, the, the federal law specifies that it's gonna go out in the same proportion um, to school districts as their proportional allocation of the Elementary and Secondary Act 1A funds. So they've, they've already decided how the money goes out. So, um, you know, there would be a, dis a little bit of a disconnect there if, you, if we tried to reduce some revenues in the education fund. Well, so, so um, what does that mean, what you just, just said? Um, the, the, this purport, the formula, that they, what does that mean? Okay, this, this is a new area for me. So um, if there's an Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, ESEA, yep. which um, Jeff Bannon probably knows about. Yep. Um, that has an allocation to states every year. I don't know how that formula works, but I do oh, okay. know how much we've had allocated in prior years of the total. And it was just a little bit over 0.2% of the total. So okay. um, that's how I came up with the, um, the $30 million estimate. It also specifies in the bill that that determines how much money comes to the state. And it also determines how the state has to allocate it to the school districts. So, so we're, just, we're just acting as pass-throughs. 
So school districts get ESEA money. Yes. Through some kind of formula. Yes. And this 30 million or whatever it is, is going to go directly to the school districts according to that same formula. Yes, it'll, right? it'll, it'll, it'll go through the agency of education, but yeah. basically, yes. It's basically gonna go there. Yep. So um, now in terms of how the money can be used, um, when I looked at the language, I, I don't think it's very restrictive. I mean, the, the, the first use allowed is any activity authorized by the ESEA of uh, 1965, which seems to include a lot of spending. We'll have to do some more work to find out what that is. And then there's also some specific perm, uh, permissions to spend the money for COVID-19 related things. I'm assuming that's because those things are not in the ESEA um, world and can be spent, but it looks to me like the money can be used for a lot of different, a lot of different reasons. So that, that's all I really have for you on the, on the, uh, the stimulation bill at this point. Um, the only other thing we've been working on is um, if, if we end up having to set yields, or if you have to end up setting yields for FY21, and we're still flying blind at this point. And we, right now, we don't know when we're gonna have reliable, reliable estimates for FY21. There have been two, two options kicked around. One is the default yields. Yeah. Um, and that would just mean using the FY 2020 yields and tax rate in FY21. The other option um, that's a possibility is to use the um, December one yields that the commissioner recommended back in January. The advantage of using those yields would be that when school boards were forming their budgets yeah. and looking at the tax rate implications for their for their voters, those are the yields that they had in mind. So um, the, the tax rates that result from those parameters that were, were recommended back in January wouldn't be a big surprise to either taxpayers or school boards. Um, and but um, in the in the next version, the next iteration of this, the uh, issue brief we've been working on. Um, Chloe did do some um, detailed analysis on this. She actually went through and did the runs. Now, you can't tell what the impact is going to be on the bottom line of the education fund, but we can calculate what homestead property tax rates and the non-homestead property tax rate would be, what the average tax rates are and that kind of thing. So um, that, that information is available. What we wouldn't know is what the impact is on the bottom line, but it, it may be that we're not going to know that for a significant you know, amount of time. So. Um, and then the only other thing I've learned um, since we last talked was um, there's a little bit more money outstanding that we, than we were anticipating. We initially thought there was about $125 million in education property taxes still outstanding. And based on new information that Chloe received from the um, tax department, it looks like it's about $132 million now and involves a few more um, communities. Again, that's, that's a probably a bigger problem for those municipalities than it is for the Ed Fund. But, um, mm -hmm. I think it's worth keeping in mind. And the other big change is that the governor um, announced um, yesterday, I think that um, the provision of childcare by school districts is now encouraged as opposed to required uh, mm -hmm. because there were some problems um, mm -hmm. getting the, uh, the teachers mm -hmm. union to agree to have teachers doing that kind of stuff. So um, that, that will take some, maybe take some pressure off of districts there. Um, Mark, um, sure. who, who pays for that? Who pays for the child care? Um, the, the, or what fund pays for it? Right. The, the only directives I've seen from the governor's office so far indicated that um, the state was going to pay for it, and the, but the amount and the um, how that money would actually be distributed from which fund wasn't clear. So I, I don't know if some of this federal money could be used um, to offset some of those costs, but um, I'm, I'm flipping for my section here. So let's see. Uh, Yeah, so the, the, the administration indicated that school districts that required supplemental funding for child care services provided to essential workers would be reimbursed, source, and amount of the funding is uncertain. So some districts will be incurring that cost, others won't. How that money gets to them, I don't know at this point. Okay. Uh, questions? Committee has anyone? Joey, go ahead. And then George. Joey? Yeah, I was just going to re-ask uh, Jim Maslin's question about the state colleges and UVM monies. If, if yeah, I, can... um, I, I, I have not looked at that yet. Um, as Steve pointed out, um, this 
um, this money that was appropriated in the stimulus bill is a, is a package that includes both higher ed and um, secondary and elementary education, but I focused exclusively on the elementary and uh, secondary education provisions when I went through it, so I don't know. Roughly half and half money-wise, though. Okay. Uh, George? Um, does the announcement yesterday of... Does the announcement yesterday that the schools are not coming back in session this year, does that have any implications for all this? Um, it, it, it for um, remote remote education, uh, and there is one of the one of the uses that's specifically allowed in the federal bill is to um, beef up your IT in order to do this. Um, so um, it's possible. The, the problem for my, for us is going to be that there's parts of the state that don't have good broadband access. Kids generally use the libraries. The libraries are closed. Um, a number of other states are dealing with this. I just read this morning that I think it's Philadelphia has decided that since they can't provide special education services on an ongoing basis for kids the rest of the year, they're not going to provide any educational services to anyone. So that it's not discriminatory. So, um, I mean, this yeah. is changing by the minute. Um, I'm not sure what else to say on it, but um, I know that particularly in a rural state like ours, doing this remote kind of education is going to be going to be tough. Yeah. Um, I've got Scott, Jim, and Robin, and ask people to just remute um, after you've asked your question. That'd be helpful. Scott. Go ahead. Hey, Mark. This is Scott. Hey there. Um, so my question is, um, in the with this uh, this thirty million dollars that's been allocated to Vermont by the feds, um, if if we shorted the education fund payment to the districts and then backfilled it with that $30 million or some portion of it, would that be acceptable, do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, that's what Steve was addressing. And I, I don't know what mechanism we can use to do it. I know what we did back in the um, Great Recession, but um, we did that by changing the amount of revenues that were going into the fund rather than changing the amount of money that was going out to the districts. Um, there is a requirement that we make those payments to the district in the law, so I would think it would require a change in statute in order to do that. Right, certainly it would require language, but okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Jim and then Robin. We go. Um, Mark, with regards to the UVM and BSC money, is there a document you could point us to either now or after this? session is over that we could go read um yeah yeah we chloe and i have started to put together a sheet on this that will uh, lay out some of this stuff but we don't have it ready to go yet um right. the, the federal bill is available online but it's uh it's a long one <laughs> thank you uh robin uh jim uh, uh remute i'm looking for it okay robin thank you um Mark, I'm looking at your document that you've updated and, and talking about the education yields and our two options of um, uh, defaulting to last year's, which looks like it raises about 1.2 billion in the, and if we use the December letter, it's about 1.22 billion. So if we do that and it's still not enough money um, for our, uh, we're supposed to cover the education, but if it's not enough money, where does the money come from? First of all, I just want to clarify that these aren't your only two options. These are two right. options that we, okay. that we pulled up. You're free, you're free to do whatever right. you want. Same question, though, regardless of whatever it is we do, we're, we're guessing. Yes. We don't know what's going to happen. If we guess wrong and we short it, what happens? Where do we get the money? I, I don't know. That's okay. true now, though. I, that's, a, that's always a problem. Yeah, that, that, right. Going forward, it's I'm, always I'm more problem. worried about it this year than I would have been last year. Yeah, I, and I think, again, there's enough money floating around, I think, to get us through 2020. It's going to be what happens next year. We yeah. don't know what the bottom line is going to be, so you may have to set the yields you know, where, where you think is appropriate and then come back and adjust things. I mean, I, I don't know what else to, to okay. say. We're, so we can adjust. Uh, yeah, Tom Cavett right now is working with, you know, this is crazy. It's epidemiological studies to try to guess, you know, what the impact is going to be and how long it's going to last in order to give us a revenue estimate for, for 2021. But I think we're a ways from, from getting something that's what we could rely on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a good question. I think one of one of the things I wonder is, is setting the yields when we really don't have enough information to do it and knowing we're gonna have to go back and look at them 
Mm -hmm. Is that helpful or is it more helpful to acknowledge that we don't know and not try to set them? But Well, the, the only problem with that is for FY21, school districts start normally in normal circumstances would start sending out bills in I know. August. I know. And, well, so, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you're right. you're, I mean, there may be more time to deal with this. There's no, there's no, there's no rush to deal with this un until you're getting to the point where you're ready to adjourn. We and don't normally set them until May anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, technically, we don't set them often until it's the last bill that comes out in the session. So sometimes it's you know it's the end of May, and it could go as late as the end of June. Ju June, um, but mm -hmm. we'll start to create logistical problems for districts and the tax department at some point mm -hmm. if they don't have the machinery operating to get. The tax bills out, uh, you know, yeah. an estimate of how much money we owe them and how much money we're going to collect, and property tax adjustments and all that stuff. Yeah, and and it's something. I mean, I don't know about everyone else, but it but it's something that weighs on me because I know we're going to have to do it. So it's not it's not like we can just ignore it and not be thinking about it. But it may be better to um, try to be patient until we have more information. Right. Uh, let me see if I have other questions. I do. Uh, Bill Canfield. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, Mark, I just want I just want to ask again the question about uh, if we use our reserve and surplus to get through on fiscal year 2020. Uh, well, what are your thoughts on us using this uh, this money to backfill those reserves for going forward? Right, that, that's, that's the issue which Steve was addressing. And it's a little tricky because the money comes from the feds, goes through uh, the agency of education and directly to the towns and not through the education fund. So there may be a mechanism by which we can, you know, effectively have that money pass to the ed fund by lowering revenues or something like that and making it work. But um, at this point, we haven't, haven't worked all that out yet. Thank you. You're, you're, but you're what you're right between the you know we're actually going into this. The education fund is actually was fairly healthy, um, at least the projections a month ago. We had almost fifty million dollars in surplus and reserves. If we get another thirty million dollars in from the feds, we're talking eighty, and we're only looking at a thirty-five to forty-five million dollar downgrade at this point. So there's a lot of money there. It's just you know our system is unique. I mean the other forty-nine states do not have a system like ours. Um, when the feds write these laws, they're assuming that we have a foundation grant where we're just sending money from the state to the districts as aid, and the districts are responsible responsible for raising whatever they want. Otherwise, we don't have a system like that. We're, we have a you know we have a statewide tax and local administration, so it's a lot trickier for us to try to um, sort of fit shoehorn into the, the federal regulation. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there's anyone else. Any other questions? Mark, did you have more that you were going to go over with us? Um, no, that, that's basically the, all okay. the additional information we've been able to gather so far. So um, it, we're, it's changing, changing by the hour. It is. It is. Um, but it is actually, uh, it's encouraging to uh, have the federal government step up to the extent that they have. So at least, at least the problems have shifted a little bit from just being underwater. Um, yeah, the, the one other thing I would mention, I guess, is that you know, Steve talked about um, additional costs local districts are facing, and I'm, I'm not sure how significant those costs are going to be over and above what they've already budgeted to spend for the year. Um, the, uh, if they get reimbursed for the child care costs, that's not going to be an additional cost. The meals that they're providing should be reimbursed under the current law through mm -hmm. both the federal and the state. Um, reimbursement. So it's only the remaining issues around remote, you know, continuing remote education now that schools are closed. There may be some significant, you know, technological investment schools have to make in order to do that. But I don't know how you could do it in this kind of time frame. I mean, the schools right. are already closed. So um, it may not be, it may be that there's not a whole lot of additional spending in 2020 that we have to worry about. Yeah, good. Uh, Sam has a question. I, I mean, this isn't necessarily a question for Mark, but do we expect this bill to change at all? I mean, I did see somebody's potentially calling for a quorum in Congress, so everybody's going to have to go back there. But we don't. We know. don't know. No, nope, yeah. nobody's really read anything about that. I um, mean, I've read the same story, but we don't know if it's going to change. Yeah, I, I think that's more likely to delay it by a day or so than, than it is to change it. But um, that's based on just what I read this morning. Yeah. 
Uh, somebody's got something in the background. I don't know who it is. Maybe it's not me, but anyway, um, it looks like everybody's muted. So, so there you go. Um, okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so, nice to see you every day. So, <laughs> pretty much. I'm starting to get used to this. this is yeah, crazy. getting used to it. Um, and so we're going to hear from Jeff Fannin um, on just sort of the general issues um, around education, finance, and schools. And then um, after we listen to Jeff, uh, our next witness is, oh, I have Mark back down here again, but I think it's probably um, uh, Polly Major from uh, Leahy, uh, Senator Leahy's office um, is going to be with us. And, uh, and then we will be done for the day. Um, I have a couple of things I just want to throw out before we adjourn, though. Um, so, Jeff. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Welcome to my home. It's, it's, it, it's funny that these Zoom meetings are very intimate now. We get to see people's homes. And I, uh, and <laughs> I didn't see them live in, in Venice. He does. He, he's accommodating me. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be so lucky. Yeah. Um, but and welcome, uh, Representative Kornheiser. So uh, and good to see everybody. And I'm glad everybody's in good health. Uh, I submitted written testimony to Sorsha last evening, and, and I think you have it. And I also included a document from NEA that I thought was real. I read it, and I thought this is a really good summation and summary of the the federal legislation that's kicking around, and hopefully will pass today or this weekend or whatever the case may be. Um, it gives an outline of all the stuff that's in play. Um, and I just thought in one condensed item uh, document, it was a really helpful resource for me. So I, I thought I would share it. Thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, as you will. So I just thank you for giving me the opportunity here. Um, these last two weeks have just been mind boggling, incredible. Uh, and trying to come to grips with the education system and comprehend the effects <clears throat> on the schools. I don't know if I'm, am I, uh, am I, do you still hear me? We can hear you, yes. Um, Sorsha, I'm gonna suggest that we not do screen sharing on this document, uh, just so I can keep track of who's who's got their hand up and so on. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, schools are doing- It's, it's on the website, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jeff. Um, I'll try to be brief here, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't just mention all the great work that administrators are doing, teachers, support staff, bus drivers, kitchen folks, uh, the governor closing schools, and everybody is stepping up in various ways and different capacities. Uh, we've been trying to meet with uh, the other folks, Jeff Francis, Sue Siglowski, Jay Nichols. Um, there are issues coming along and we're trying to deal with them and deal with them as well as we can, but the, uh, it, it's been a challenge. The speed has been just incredible. And you know this better than I do, I know. Um, the economics of, the, of this pandemic, pandemic are pretty serious. Two, the hole that, that Mark is talking about and possibly the federal legislation that might help fill it, good, but they are still problems. Um, one issue that I think that uh, I'd be, I need to mention to you is the, Financial, it's not in my memo, but um, if school employees are being paid, it's good for the state for them, selfishly, honestly, but it's also good for the state economically. They're able to go out and purchase things, sales and use tax and other things. That's all good. And they're doing that. Um, the one, so teachers are now working remotely and expected to do so. Many support staff are working in other capacities, some remotely, but a lot of them going to the schools. What you may not know or may not hear about too often is the fact that when they're doing that and getting paid, they contribute to the state retirement systems. And two thirds of the folks in the VEMER system, the municipal system, are in fact school employees. So two thirds of the folks in the municipal system are school employees. The teacher system is a teacher system. And when they don't make contributions to the system, my understanding is that the, typically what happens is that contributions come in from active employees and some of that money is used to pay current retirees not all of it but some of it if you start reducing that money for either this teacher system or the municipal system the treasurer may have to uh, liquidate some assets uh, right now the stock market is not very high and it's taken an enormous hit in the last month or so um, and so the treasurer would be in the unenviable position or the state would be 
of trying to sell assets at a low, a very extremely low point. That's not good short term or, and it's even worse long term. So there's real um, negative consequences of not paying people. So we've been trying to work with the superintendents and administrators to make sure that everybody's got something to do. So they remain on the payroll. Um, that's good for them and also good for the state. And I know that's um, uh, not always easy in all places, but we're trying to work it out. And I know people are trying desperately to make that happen. So um, that's out there. The other piece is there, there are a number of, I think it's 21 schools that haven't yet voted uh, or need to re vote, nine that need to re 12 that haven't yet voted. And I don't know, um, <clears throat> I'm worried cause concerns there. And so those are the financial concerns that we share with you and, and understand that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. That's, that's okay. truly the gist of my testimony, but we're, we're working on problems, trying to address them. And, yeah. and uh, I appreciate your work on this, this area as well. Thank you. So we're all, we've all learned something. Um, this is all at every level on different ways of operating. Let me see if there is a question. Sam does, has, Sam has one. Jeff, I was wondering if you're hearing any, uh, how much of a problem lack of internet access is for kids trying to do school work? So uh, I just got off, we have a, a daily staff call now, a Zoom call. And that was the last thing we talked about. It is real, it's not, not real for the students. I heard from a teacher last night, the closest internet she has is 40 minutes. And just to prove the point, we're losing you right now. Welcome to Callus, right? Representative I'm Manson. here. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, if you turn uh, off your video feed, it might help the sound quality. Thank you. Uh, probably better for you anyway. Um, I look better that way. So it's, Representative Young, it is a huge issue, the internet, and it's one of equity. And it's bad and it's it's you know, it's probably better in Chittenden County than in some places, but there are still equity issues there too. It's certainly in the Northeast Kingdom so in, in the more rural parts of the state. Some uh, telco companies are stepping up and providing internet to students, which is great. But if their teachers don't have it, that's a problem. And that is, we've got that around the state. So um, it is, it's shining a huge light on the infrastructure challenges that we've had. And, and it's been a, it's been a long-term problem and I don't know if this is going to solve it, but people are desperately trying to get internet to the last mile and that's really important, uh, but it's not there yet. It is an issue. It's one of equity. That's truly the equity issue. And what about access to iPads and, you know, hardware, whatever it is you need to um, stay in touch with your school? Um, I think, a, you know, a lot of kids have it. Um, I just heard a story about how uh, one teacher is reaching out to, I think it's first or second grade kids to, uh, they've, they're having a Zoom call, all of them, but that presumes somebody, everybody's got a, a, a lap, laptop. And yeah. then she's, she's also following up with telephone calls weekly to the students, every single one individually talking with them. But that's really tough on a young, young family, uh, how you do that with a young kid. So if you don't have hardware, and they, a lot of kids don't, a lot of schools have provided Chromebooks to kids, but not to all grades. Right. So it, it um, it's an issue. Hardware as well as internet access are both issues. We've got three teachers testifying this afternoon in house education uh, to talk about remote learning issues. One from elementary, a special ed teacher, which is another whole issue, as well as a, a high school teacher. Uh, and they can really, if you want to hear from teachers, there are plenty out there. But the special ed issue is a big one that we see coming down the road, because as long as you're providing educational services to to regular ed kids, I'll call it that way, then statu then under IDEA, the Individual Education Disabilities Education Act, the federal law, special ed law, then you've got to provide special services to the kids on an IEP. So as long as you're providing education for any regular kids, you've got to provide it for the kids on an IEP. And it's, that's for good and valid reasons. But we are trying to roll out, uh, as the governor said yesterday, by uh, April 13 to have continuity plans in place and going forward. And that creates uh, a host of special ed challenges that the feds are trying to deal with and we may have to as well here in Vermont. 
Uh, let me see if there's other questions, Jeff. Uh, Bill, Canfield. There you are. Uh, I noticed you're talking about how the teachers and the administration or the, uh, the, the staffs are still teaching kids remotely and sending meals home. <clears throat> Twice you mentioned that the governor closed schools. The governor dismissed schools, and that's the terminology that should be used. That allows the work to continue. Yep. I, 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 sorry if I if I said closure. I, it, sort of just in the head. Um, I think that's right. It is. Schools have been dismissed. That's, that's what we're all using. Um, and I think that uh, the reason it's done is so that we can still keep people employed. That was one of the issues, um, as well as work then remotely. Uh, they're dismissed for a period, but to allow teachers time to sort of figure out how to do a remote lesson plan for all their kids, find out whether they have internet, a computer, and all those good things. So you're, you're absolutely right, Representative Canfield, is a dismissal, not a closure. Um, let me see if there's anyone else. Uh, Scott, did you want to jump on? Yes, go ahead, Scott. Hey Jeff, this is Scott. Um, to what to what degree are our schools able to recapture overhead costs that are no longer applicable? Um, lights, heat, supplies, uh, anything else that is germane to having kids in the school, and are they able to capture that? In, and if so, are they transferring it to technology? The answer is I don't know. <laughs> to be very honest with you, I would hope that they're being smart about it. I, I'm sure I know they're working uh, night and day. I was emailing with a principal last night at 1030. So I know that they are working hard um, trying to figure it out. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Can they cut down on oil or wood chip costs or something for heat? Certainly. Um, and I hope that they're making savings there and redirecting those to places uh, such as infrastructure for internet that kids need. So I don't know that there's, I've never heard, I've not heard people doing that specifically, but I certainly think that they're trying hard to use every available resource to make, uh, give kids the opportunity to learn as much as possible. Yeah, it would, it would seem like a natural place to go to get technology to kids. It, it, yeah, the speed, uh, as you know, is, is just earth shattering. And so people are just trying to catch up with the events of an hour ago, uh, let alone think of what's going to happen tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, anyone else? I don't see any other hands. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Um, and, you know, we recognize how, oh, I see Jim. Jim is, I, I know he's not just saying goodbye. Um, um, we recognize how much teachers are having to uh, sort of re rethink the way they do their work. Um, I've got two kids in the system and I know it's a ton of work um, for them. So we appreciate that. Well, thank you all for your work and, and uh, best of luck and I hope everybody stays well. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, so committee, we're gonna hear from, um, well, is, is she on? I'm not sure. I don't think so yet. No, okay. She had well, a call until 11.15, so she'll be on as soon as she's off. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, so I, I just wanna throw out, I'm trying to think whether these are ideas that um, I should throw out, probably not. Where are they? I don't know where they are. Um, Things that I, I, I've lost my list, sorry. Um, things that I hope that we'll be thinking about, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, over the short term, um, and some of it affects education finance and some of it's just revenue generally, is this whole question about the uh, trust taxes, the rooms and meals taxes and the sales tax, um, whether we want to uh, create a deadline uh, for both filing in order to be able to get the information that we need from filers um, that at that Tom Cabot and Jeff Carr need in order to be able to do estimates. Um, and then the other uh, question about whether it really makes sense to 
um, get that money in as soon as we can, understanding that there's a lot of support for businesses that we may be able to tap into from the federal money um, that would be more useful than the than diverting the tax revenue. Just stuff we need to think about. Um, and then the other, another question is uh, what, if anything, we want to do about the Homestead Declaration. Um, what, if any, what, if anything, we want to do right now about the tax rates. We clearly need to do them at some point, but I'm not sure exactly when. Um, and I got something from Sorsha here. Oh, she's on now. Um, I'll find my list before we're done. So um, those are just things I want us to kind of be mulling over. So. Um, uh, Sam has a question. Sam has a question. Sam, go ahead. So are we asking for the trust taxes for people to uh, file their forms so we know what they would pay, even if they can't pay it? Is that what I'm kind of, yeah. makes sense to me. That, that's one of the things I wanted to throw out there for people to think about. Um, if we were to do that, then I, we would want to put it out, you know, some period of time. Um, but, you know, like two or three weeks, not, not a long time, probably. Um, but just be, it's, it's something that's come up in the conversation. And if we're, if we're going to do a bill, um, that would be something that I think we would want to put in the bill. Um, another another whole subject. Maybe maybe I'll postpone this until we've listened to our next witness. And um, I've got another couple things. Sarsha, I, somebody just texted me. I'm not even sure who, but they said our live stream is silent. Ah. Maybe it's supposed to be. No, it's not. Uh, Sarsha, do you want to take a second and see if you can sort that out or should we um, just I'll, I'll reach out to it i think we should go on um there are several oh. people watching the stream and it looks like it's working for most but i'll check into it thanks sam okay great uh polly major um i see that you're on i i don't i think you're on oh you are oh good nice to see you welcome Thank to you. our committee uh such as we are and um I'm Janet Ansel, we haven't met. Um, you can see who else is here on the call. Um, and we really appreciate your uh, being willing to shift from yesterday to today and are uh, looking forward to hearing um, you share what information you can from Senator Leahy's office. Well, I was very grateful uh, for the switch from yesterday to today because it gave me a little bit more chance to read some of this rather mammoth bill. Um, Hello, everyone. I'm Polly Major. I'm a field representative for Senator Leahy. I cover health, housing, human services, education, nutrition. Um, and Representative Ansel and Sorsha reached out to me. She said you were interested in hearing about education. So I looked into the Education Stabilization Fund portion of the CARES Act. Yeah. Um, and I can give a brief overview of that if that would be useful. And on anything else, if I don't know the answer, I'll let you know. That's great. That would be great. We've been sort of focused in the education world for a bit anyway, so I think that's great. Thank you. Great. So CARES Act, which passed the Senate um, and is going to the House, hopefully to be passed uh, on voice vote today, but that's yet to be seen, uh, included an education stabilization fund of $30.7 billion that will be available through September 30th, 2021. Um, there are 2% of small carve outs off the top of that, uh, leaving a remainder of, let me pull up my other chart, uh, $30.1 billion um, that will be allocated to the states. And that um, allocation happens in three primary chunks. So the first is a governor's emergency education relief fund. Uh, which is 9.8%. Uh, so that nationwide is $2.9 billion. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the, we haven't seen the formula runs for Vermont yet. Um, so we'll, we can get you that information when we have it, when we can anticipate what's coming to Vermont. But right now we just have the national numbers. So there's the, the Governor's Relief Fund, um, which is, allocated based on student population in the states. Uh, and it is fairly flexible uh, for use supporting LEAs 
and institutes of higher learning um, and childcare. So that is a pretty broadly flexible fund that gives a lot of discretion to the governor. Um, there's then the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, and that's 43.9% um, or $13.2 billion nationwide. And that will go to the eight state agencies of education. I believe the proportion is also uh, based on the number of pupils in the state. Um, and that is to be sub, 90% of that is to be subgranted directly to LEAs to support educational act activities through the, uh, through this coronavirus pandemic. Um, and there are a long list of eligible uses of funds um, that are at pretty broad, everything from supporting educational uh, activities, it's funding for uh, technology, both hardware, software, and connectivity technology, uh, mental health services, um, the activities necessary to continue to employ staff. So extensive list that I shared the section of the bill um, that I'm reading from with Sorsha to get out to you. And if you're interested to see that breakdown, it is right in there. I think that's better than me just reading it out um, right now. And these funds are to be allocated within one year. Um, so it's the timeline on the funds is there's a Department of Education will put out an application in 30 days from the enactment of the bill, and then an award within 30 days, uh, within a 60 day window. We've seen with the prior stimulus bill or the supplemental appropriations package that some agencies have been putting out funding a lot faster than that. So um, we could see it within 60 days, we could see it sooner than that. And we'll certainly know what Vermont will receive much sooner than that. Um, there's also the third section of that stabilization fund is a higher education um, emergency relief fund. That's 46.3% of the fund. So $13.9 billion nationwide. And that's going directly to institutes of higher education. And its formula is based on um, heavily based on the number of full-time equivalent enrolled students who are Pell eligible, um, excluding those who are enrolled exclusively in distance learning. Um, and that fund is, 50% of it is for direct student aid, I believe, um, including support for food, housing, course materials, technology. Uh, healthcare and child care for students. Uh, the other 15% is to um, support the universities in any losses or um, needs incurred because of the switch to distance learning and because of the virus. Uh, so those are the broad, the three broad uh, buckets under this bill. It's the um, the Governor's Relief Fund, the Elementary and Secondary School Relief Fund, and the Higher Education Relief Fund. Um, I think looking through the provisions at the bottom of the bill, um, the last provision is around maintenance of efforts. And it says that states that accept these funds will commit to su maintaining support for their elementary and secondary education and higher education institutions uh, for fiscal years 20 and 21 at the levels supported um, on average over the last three fiscal years. Uh, there is a waiver to this if states sustain um, fiscal burdens because of the coronavirus, but there is that provision in there. So that is, that is my overview of of the section of the CARES Act related to education. And I'm happy to okay. um, take more questions. It's really focused on the appropriation side because that's where Senator Leahy sits. There might be other authorizing provisions in there that I'm less familiar with. Let me see if people have questions. I expect they may. 
Uh, no one has one. I'll ask one. Um, we got a little bit of information about the uh, how the money is going to be allocated, the formula that's going to be used, um, which of course doesn't really make sense in Vermont because we have this unique system. Is there any going to be any kind of flexibility? Um, I, I don't know how familiar you, you are with Vermont's finance system for schools, but it's unique. Um, so. Just wondering if there's going to be any kind of flexibility for us. You know, that's, um, I think a lot of our work moving forward is going to be trying to answer those questions. Uh, this bill is definitely the, the bones of these programs, but there's a lot left unanswered that will be needed to be answered by the agency. So that's something that we can um, either send release office or as a delegation request on behalf of the state of Vermont. We need kind of more details, but that's something we can keep our eyes out and look into. Yeah. I mean, I understand we're thrilled with the money, um, but we're concerned about how how we can use it both but with respect to the schools. We have this kind of weird situation. Um, there's also this broader question, which I, I know you're familiar with, is whether we can use money in the, you know, out of the big pot of money um, to replace lost revenue, which is what we really need to be able to do more than um, there's some reimbursing of costs that are associated with COVID-19, but um, there is a real issue with the fact that revenue is, um, is going to be declining uh, really mm -hmm. dramatically. And that, that question relates to the um, general state aid yes. fund. Yep. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah, it's broader, broader than education, but mm -hmm. I just need to put it out there because yep. it is an issue. Uh, I've got a couple questions here, Jim, I think, and then Peter, um, at least. So Jim, you go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, Polly. Thanks very much. Um, in particular, as soon as there's information available on distribution of the money for uh, post-secondary education, universities, state colleges, um, anything that you could get to Sorsha that she can get out to us, maybe that might be the simplest way. Um, be glad to read it as soon as it's available okay. and I understand your um your your time is spoken for seven ways but thank you certainly we'll get that out to you and I know my um colleague has been working with Chancellor Spalding to provide the state colleges some understanding of how they can benefit from this I think because of the um because of the makeup of their student bodies with them having higher proportions of Pell eligible students, um, they will receive you know, proportionally a little bit more of this fund than other the private universities in Vermont. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Peter. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. Actually, you went right to my question. It is because of the uniqueness of our funding system interpretations about maintenance of effort uh, and uh, what is reimbursable as opposed to using repl uh, replenishing funds that uh, amount to replacements becomes very nuanced in Vermont. And I would just hope that the um, delegation in Washington and say Mark and yourself would, would uh, draw up a, a kind of cheat list of do's and don'ts so that we don't find out that we we made a mistake committing funds from the wrong kitty. Thank you. And I think that's something that the um, folks at the Agency of Education will actually have a lot of the expertise on. Um, they'll, they'll be more familiar um, than I with a lot of the provisions within ESSA that govern how this money is being spent. But we, we are in contact with them and can continue to work with them to provide clarity and to advocate on, their, on Vermont's behalf. Uh, other questions anyone has? I've got a specific unrelated question. If I'm, I'm just looking to see if anybody wants to jump in on, on the subject in front of us. Let me just ask you my unrelated question. Is there any consideration being given in Congress to allowing um, uh, people who are required to take the minimum distribution on their 401ks to uh, bypass a year? I'm going to pass on that one. Um, would, you relay that, would you relay that along? Because it's, sure. a, it's, it's a real concern. Um, it's an awful time to take money out of your 401k 
Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't need to take it out, it doesn't seem like anybody benefits from forcing uh, people to do that. So uh, I would really appreciate uh, getting some feedback on it. So that's, can, can individuals withdraw, delay withdrawals from their 401k? Can they, can they bypass a year? Can, okay. can we, can you, can we suspend the required minimum distribution from a 401k for a year? Thanks. Graham uh, so I will, I will certainly ask our folks that uh, we do have a, as every congressional office does a casework team um, that's available to help people yeah. answer their individual questions. And they actually are really our experts on tax issues. So I'm going to ask them that, but just Remember that is a place where you can refer your constituents. This is not, this is not an individual question. This would be a law change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there would have to be a law change to make it happen. Looks like Graham is telling me something here. Graham says it's in the federal bill. Is it? Yes, Madam Chair, that's in the, that's in the federal bill. Um, there's two provisions regarding retirement. Thank you. Your retirement funds up to $100,000 can be withdrawn from your retirement account right now without paying the 10% penalty, which we also have a penalty on ours, um, which right. is linked to the federal. So indirectly, we would be offering that benefit. But also, there's a provision about suspending the minimum distribution rules for just 2020. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there's other questions here. I don't think so. Thank you very much for your help. And um, it, the document that you provided, which is on our committee page, is excellent. So um, I encourage people to go and look at it and um, start to take it in. But I really appreciate your uh, coming uh, uh, coming to our meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, There'll be lots of questions moving forward. We're happy to continue to ask them of the agencies. Um, and we will, we do anticipate looking at a further bill down the road. We just want to see how this one will work first. So keep that in mind. Um, that's a lot of our work in the next month. Very good. Thank you. Um, all right, committee. So we're uh, closing in on whatever time it is we thought we were going to stop, which I guess we're at at 1130 or so. I finally found my list of things that I wanted to have people think about. Um, uh, the first one I did talk about, which is whether we um, uh, put a, a date on filing the trust tax returns. Um, and I don't know exactly what date it would be, but just make sure that uh, people do file. Um, another thought is whether we ought to put an end date on this uh, deferral that you um, you have to actually pay, file and pay by X date in order to avoid penalties and interest on the trust taxes. So it, there's, a, there's just an end date to it rather than having it open-ended. Um, I have a note to myself whether we should have a state. So somebody asked me this question, uh, whether it, it would make sense given the difficulty that we're having with the timing of the education tax payments. Um, whether it makes sense to actually set payment dates so that we don't run into this kind of situation as this, situ this uh, economic crisis rolls on. Um, another question that's come up is whether what to do about the penalty for late payments on the part of municipalities. Um, that came up when Karen Horn spoke to us. I think that's an 8% penalty if the town is late sending the money to the state seems like a lot. Um, and another thing, Mark, this is something, I don't know if Mark's still on. Yeah, there he is. Um, um, maybe you can answer this quickly, but the um, if, a, if a school hasn't adopted a budget and for the schools that haven't adopted them, it's gonna be actually kind of hard for them to do it because of the voting challenges. Mm -hmm. um, what, what uh, there's some uh, rule that they, go to 87% of last year, I think, or some number. Um, yeah, I, how does, can you tell us how that works? Yes, and um, Abby Shepard may be able to help out here as well. Okay. But, I got um, Abby on here too. Yes, um, my, so, 
two, there's two provisions. Um, one provision, I think that um, if a school budget hasn't passed by June 30th, there's a default in current law that would allow a district to continue to operate by borrowing funds necessary uh, to enable it to operate up to 87% of their most recently approved budget. I think that presumes that they can borrow, um, which may be a question. And then there's another provision that said that um, an interim homestead education tax rate shall be imposed at a base rate of a dollar um, oh. without regard to any spending adjustment. Um, and then within 30 days after a budget um, is adopted and deadline is passed, the commissioner can determine the municipality's homestead tax rate. So there, there are provisions in there in the event that a school district is unable to pass a school budget by June 30th. So why do they have to borrow? Um, I believe they, I, I will have to, I, I don't want to spitball here on it. I'm, I'm assuming it's because they're not going to get an education payment, but I really need to go back. And this is an area of law that's been in the books all the time I've been here, but we've never had to right. delve into it. So yeah, um, yeah. maybe, I'm maybe not, we could, I'm sure education committee wants to know about it as well, but maybe we can get some information on it um, next week and sort of understand a little bit, a little, uh, there's got, there's going to be one school district out there that's not going to be able to, um, probably more than one um, that's not going to be able to get a budget adopted. So let's um, let's at least find out what the what again they do, they do have until June thirtieth. So there is a little time. It depends on how long this rolls on for. Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay. Um, other uh, uh, anything else? Uh, Sam has got his hand up. I'm sorry, I've been ignoring you. It's okay. It wasn't that long. Um, I just I did get a note that said that the tax department had asked people to file even if they couldn't pay the taxes yeah um and that came in and then you you made the comment about the eight percent penalty yeah. and it also occurs to me that there's the eight percent penalty on the personal level that mm -hmm. is always i've always kind of considered a little unfair and i don't know well that eight percent the towns can waive um they, they can but they can, it, there's a lot of individual discretion in it a lot of discretion in it. Um, I, I heard the tax department as well, sort of the encouraged to file. Um, and I think that's really helpful, um, but I'm wondering whether we need to say they have to file. Um, that, that, that the way you get penalties and interest waived is you file um, and at some point you pay. Um, just because it seems to me that the way the federal money is designed, um, what, the better thing to do is to move money out to um, where, where it's needed, which is frankly, a lot of our small businesses uh, directly. But anyway, probably a lot more to it than, than I've been able to think through. Uh, Peter, Anthony, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, um, I I wanted to uh, support uh, Janet's uh, suggestion that maybe it was premature to waive open-endedly penalties and and whatnot for not filing. I really think it causes additional problems not to have at least the homestead uh, filing done by June first, um, and I I think that illustrates a problem that um, Steve Klein had a suggestion. Uh, earlier on in our meeting, namely what we seem to be uh, lacking and which will be extraordinarily useful as we draw down federal money is some kind of working group or working relationship steering committee, uh, words like that between the executive and legislative branches. I, I really, uh, earlier in the week, I ruminated about this uh, somewhat audibly and I, I, I just think it's unfortunate that uh, people are leading but not necessarily coordinating the uh, content of that leadership with other um, entities that are uh, crucial to carrying out a successful policy, uh, particularly in the area of budget finance and uh, now federal aid uh, uh, in the mix. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, and I wanna clarify that when I was talking about filing, I, I wasn't including the Homestead Declaration. I think people should be encouraged to get it in. I don't see how we can require it until their income taxes are due um, for most of them. We can do a lot to try to help them to do it as early as possible. 
but um, I'm I'm at a loss as to how we can force it. But anyway, maybe we can come up with something. So, um, but I was thinking merely of the trust taxes. Uh, let's see, anybody else? Anybody got any ideas they want to uh, throw out for uh, next week? We're going to meet, um, as far as I know, I, we'll plan on Tuesday at 10. I, this 10 o'clock hour, I don't know how it's working for other people. Um, I, I'd like to stick with it for a bit. Um, these meetings are a little tiring, so I'm not, we're not doing long days. Um, I don't know whether we'll start including an afternoon session or not. I'm not doing it today, but maybe we will next week. Whoops, I have a message from Scott. Hold on. Oh, Scott's agreeing. <laughs> no, he's raising his hand. Raising his hand. Okay. Scott, did you want to jump in? Hi. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Sure. Um, I just want to uh, one point regarding the, the trust taxes and filing. Um, there, I don't understand why um, why we're letting people delay filing. Um, just because you file doesn't mean you pay. And filing is really important because as we try to seek clarity on revenue, uh, that's the only way we know what the actual dollars are. If nobody's filing, we won't know those dollars. So I would really discourage any delay in filing, although the real discussion is is the the delay of any payment or or penalties or interest. Um, the second point is um, regarding the yield bill and setting of numbers and everything. Maybe this is conversation is happening. I, I suspect it probably is, but I think we need some real clarity about what the the speaker and the pro tem think the end of the session is going to look like and when it's going to be because. I mean, this is this work is taking a long time because of the format that we've been forced to use. Um, it makes a whole big difference if we're trying to get this done early May or mid June, or it'd be nice if we could get some some clarity on that. Yeah, I agree. Um, yes, um, I think I think we I, I think we will. I'm not sure that they're clear at the moment. Um, other, other than I think what I heard at this session yesterday is that at least in the for the near future, we're not going to um, we're going to continue to do token sessions and, you know, yeah. uh, keep keep everything open and operating as uh, but I don't know how long that's going to last. Uh, Robin. Yes, thank you. In response to um, with Scott's uh, question about timing too. I did read that uh, Senator Ash told the Senate to cons to assume there's gonna be work done over the summer and even into the fall. Obviously that's not every day, but that our work is not gonna end yeah. at the normal time. So I, I have that in the back of my mind as we go ahead. Yeah, um, it's, I, I, there's, there's a piece of me that says, gee, I can't travel, but uh, probably couldn't anyway. So um, I think we should plan to be um, plan to be working. That's my guess, but I but I don't know that officially. Um, I heard the same thing you did, Robin. Thank you. Uh, others, anybody? Um, other thoughts about next week? We'll we'll stay with the ten o'clock time frame. Um, other people you want to hear from? Uh, I, um, I I guess my feeling, um, if people have anything specific they want to hear from, please let me know or let Sorsha know. Um, but a lot of what I'm going to do is continue to learn, you know, it's kind of layers, learn um, more about the things that we've already learned a bit. I, I am going to ask the tax commissioner to come in again. Um, you know, the, the, I'm torn because they've got so much work to do. Same with our staff. On the other hand, you know, we need to um, we, we need to get the information so we can begin to develop a bill. I did want to throw out um, uh, the miscellaneous tax bill and that if we are at a point where we're sort of at a standstill for taking testimony on um, COVID-19 related issues that um, we can go back and do some work on that bill. I think we're basically done with it, um, that that might be something that we can move along um, and I don't think we need to worry about whether you know crossover and whether we got a vehicle to do something. I think we probably can manage that. Okay, so um, so that's those those are my thoughts for today. I've got another another uh, meeting at noon, so I'm going to grab some food, get on that meeting.
Um, I hope everybody's doing well. Stay in touch this weekend uh, if you have anything and um, just stay home, stay well. Yeah. George will tell you, wash your hands, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, and they've asked that I clearly announce that we are ending the live stream and then end it. So can you give me a moment to do that? <laughs> We're ending the live stream.